The Second World War was a period which saw massive technological leaps, especially when it came to weaponry. These included everything from early assault rifles, jet aircraft, and advanced submarines, all the way to the world-ending power of nuclear bombs. Tank technology during this period also changed rapidly, with them transforming from relatively lightly armored vehicles in the early to mid-30s into the far more heavily armored mediums and heavies within less than a decade. However, one type of armored vehicle in particular essentially saw both its creation and extinction within this global conflict, that being the tank destroyer. Today, we will explore the story of one of the most infamous tank destroyers, which is said to hold the record of having the highest kill ratio of any tank destroyer in history, the Ferdinand. While it is true that the tank destroyer concept persisted for several decades after World War II, it is undeniable that their glory days were during that conflict. Out of the dozens of designs used over the years though, none have garnered even remotely near the reputation of the German Ferdinand. A cursory search online will yield you a wide variety of videos and articles slamming the vehicle as a complete failure and prone to spontaneous combustion. Is this really the case though, or has its reputation been tarnished by years of exaggerations and misconceptions? Stay tuned as we explore the story of this vehicle after a quick word from our sponsor. Finding accurate information on historical topics can often be tricky with many online sources, films, and even books repeating long-standing myths and misconceptions. For example, the myth of a tiger tank requiring numerous Shermans to knock it out has persisted for decades. This problem is not unique to history though, and is especially persistent in the news we see on a daily basis. Whether due to incomplete information, sensationalized headlines, or heavily biased reporting, it has become increasingly difficult to get an accurate report on current events. This is where today's sponsor, Ground News, comes in. Ground News gathers the world's news together in one place, allowing you to compare coverage from various sources and form a clearer picture of what is being reported on. As an example, you may have heard about the missing F-35 recently and that the crash site was found. Ground News offers not just a breakdown of that story, but links to dozens of articles which are rated to let you know how accurate the information within them is and whether they might have a political bias. They also show you stories you might be missing. For example, this story about the US Air Force falling short of their recruiting goal for the first time in two decades is mostly being covered by center or right-leaning sources, so if you typically read left-leaning news sources, you might have missed it. With my dedication to providing both accurate and unbiased information to you in my videos, I am a big fan of this approach, as they not only help inform you, but also prevent sensationalized headlines from pulling your attention away from more informative reporting. Use my link in the description to get 30% off unlimited access to ground news and become a smarter news consumer. Huge thanks to them for supporting my channel, now let's get back to the video. As with virtually all German tank destroyers during World War II, the Ferdinand was built on top of a pre-existing chassis. In this case, that chassis was of the Tiger P, commonly known as the Porsche Tiger, which had begun development in 1939 as the VK-3001P and entered production in 1941 as the VK-4501P, or Tiger P, alongside the Tiger H. Unfortunately for Porsche, despite initial support from Hitler, his Tiger was not viewed so favorably by others in the German High Command, and following a final trial pitting the Henschel and Porsche tanks against one another, the decision was made to stop production of the Porsche design. Though production ended, this still left a significant number of hulls alongside the handful of completed Porsche Tigers. These hulls now sat awaiting further completion at the Nibelungenwerk factory. The question was, what would they be used for? Some of you may wonder why these hulls were used at all, instead of just being scrapped to provide more steel for production of other tanks. On the surface, that may seem like the better option, but this doesn't consider the hundreds of man-hours which were put into the production of these hulls. 
To scrap them would not just be scrapping the hulls, but would essentially be flushing that valuable time and money spent making them down the toilet. With the invasion of the Soviet Union ongoing by this point, this was not something Germany could afford. The decision of what to do with these hulls was quickly made in December of 1942 with a plan to create a new, heavy turretless vehicle featuring thick armor using them. Armed with a powerful anti-tank gun, these vehicles could help smash through Soviet defenses while being safe from return fire. Similar to the already proven Stug 3, their use as anti-tank weapons was originally only intended as a secondary role. Of the 100 hulls available, it was decided that 91 would be assigned for conversion into Ferdinand's, with the remaining 9 being used for further testing or conversion into other Tiger P variants. Before they could see action though, the hulls would require alterations to prepare them for their new role. Unlike the Tiger P, which had a frontally mounted turret with the engine in the rear, the Ferdinand had the engines shifted forward behind the compartment where the driver and radio operator sat. Rather than rely on the unreliable Porsche engines for this new, heavier vehicle, it was decided to replace them with two HL120 petrol engines. These engines were both readily available and already proven as they were the same engines used on the Panzer III and IV. The electric drive system would remain in place, although the electric generators were moved forward into the engine compartment. Behind the engines, a superstructure was attached to house the rest of the crew as well as the main armament and ammunition. This would be another area where the Ferdinand would be improved over its original design. While it now lacked a turret, the vehicle was fitted with the 88mm Pac-43 L-71 which gave it one of the most powerful cannons of the entire war. Mounted in a ball mount, it was capable of traversing 15 degrees to the left or right with 18 degrees of elevation and 8 degrees of depression. An additional armor plate was added on the barrel to protect the more vulnerable mount from incoming rounds. For this gun, a total of 50 rounds of varying ammunition types would be carried for both armored and unarmored targets. This capacity was often increased though with crews loading further ammunition into any available space. Unlike most other armored vehicles of this period, however, the Ferdinand was not given a hull machine gun, despite the original Tiger P already featuring one. This would end up coming back to bite the Germans later when they finally reached the front. All of these changes created a vehicle with three distinct compartments. The front driver's compartment, the engine compartment, and a rear fighting compartment. Although already well protected behind 100mm of frontal armor, requirements for the Ferdinand called for double that frontally. For the hull, this was done through the use of an additional 100mm plate bolted to the front hull. This same thickness was used for the superstructure with 200mm at the front which was further increased by angling. As for the sides and rear, they remain the same with 80mm on the hull and superstructure. In order to mount this casemate, the rear hull required some redesigning to replace the previously angled corner plates to better suit the mounting of the box-like superstructure. Once this work was completed, the assembly was bolted together creating a 65-ton killing machine, the heaviest to have ever been built at that time. The designing and construction of the first two prototypes of the Ferdinand would be completed by Al Ketz, who had experience with the construction of the Sturmgeschütz III. Ferdinand Porsche was also still involved with the project at this point, which makes the fact that the vehicle began to be referred to by his name unsurprising. Interestingly though, this makes it one of the only examples of a German tank being named after a person rather than an animal. Following these first two prototypes being completed by Al Ket in early 1943, the decision was made to move the remaining production to the previously mentioned Nibelungenwerk factory in Austria. This work was reportedly still done by workers from Al Ket's, with 120 being transferred there to complete the conversions. The work would quickly be completed by May 12, 1943, when the final Ferdinand was handed over to the army. The exact number of these vehicles to be completed seems to vary slightly depending on the source. Most sources agree that 90 were constructed in total, but other sources state 91. In some cases, the same source will even use both numbers, with one even listing them on the exact same page. Whether this is due to a simple error made in original documents, or a more modern error, is unclear. 
Regardless, the exact number produced is not really important for the remainder of the Ferdinand story. It is something you may encounter if you read more on the vehicle though, so I felt it was worth mentioning. Before they even reached the front, trouble was already brewing for these new vehicles. While the conversions had been taking place in Austria, the two prototypes were being put through various trials as is typical of any new type. Unfortunately, but also unsurprisingly, these trials were quickly finding flaws in the design. Some of these were relatively simple, such as a lack of exhaust baffles or the wrong size towing hooks. Others were far more worrying though, with major problems like a lack of a tool to remove bogey wheels and fuel lines from the left fuel tank being positioned too close to the exhaust. Normally, these sorts of problems are easily resolved during production, but due to the rapid conversions and rush to get vehicles ready for the upcoming Eastern Offensive, most of them were not addressed before the vehicles were already sent east. Some of these issues were remedied by modification kits sent directly to units in the field, however this still could not change the fact that these heavy beasts were clearly not ready for what lay ahead of them. Finally, in July of 1943, the Ferdinands would get their first taste of combat with Operation Citadel, the last great German offensive in the east. Though commonly referred to today as tank destroyers, these lumbering beasts would initially operate much more like their Tiger cousins being used to assault the Soviet defenses as breakthrough tanks. With assistance from vehicles such as the Borgvard IV and Sturmpanzer IV, they battered the enemy lines, shrugging off much of the returning fire. The Soviets, however, were not as easily pushed back as when the invasion began several years prior, a fact the crews of the Ferdinands would quickly learn. Repeatedly, vehicles were knocked out from mines, and due to the immense weight of these armored behemoths, they proved incredibly difficult to recover. Reportedly, it could require up to five heavy half-tracks to tow back a single Ferdinand, putting all vehicles and personnel at risk from enemy fire during the process. This situation was later partially remedied with the creation of the Berg Panzer Tiger P, which were both better armored and fully enclosed. These proved vital in keeping many Ferdinands from being lost, allowing them to be towed back for repairs. However, these were not available during this initial combat debut, and this led to many difficult recoveries. Mines were only one of the crew's fears, with the lack of vision which comes from being in an armored vehicle, combined with no close defense weapons, such as a hull machine gun, making them easy prey for anti-tank units. Anti-tank rifle fire, Molotov cocktails, grenades, the list goes on for the variety of threats these crews faced. Even attacks which didn't outright destroy the vehicle or kill the crew still caused costly repairs or lost time slowing the offensive. Within less than a week of fighting, all the losses combined made for 19 complete losses and around half the total Ferdinands out of action in need of repairs. One report illustrates how badly the situation would become by late July, stating, the Ferdinand tank destroyers, like the Sturmpanzer, had an extraordinary number of mechanical problems. It was planned to withdraw them for two to three days following a three to five day operation, and for longer periods after longer operations to effect repairs. The maintenance units have worked day and night to repair damaged vehicles so that sufficient vehicles are available to face the enemy. Due to the excessive demands placed upon all vehicles by the tactical situation, they all need an immediate 14 to 20 day overhaul. Among these losses were several caused by engine fires. Although not as prevalent as many memes online make it seem, there were at least four which were lost this way. These appear to have been caused by a variety of factors. One of these was the insufficient cooling caused by an overcrowded engine compartment which actually caused fuel to boil in some instances. As mentioned earlier, the poor placement of fuel lines could have contributed as well, and some reports do indicate a few suffered fires caused by electrical shorts, however it is unclear if this resulted in lost vehicles or just minor fires. The actual number lost to fires seems to be fairly low, contrary to the modern reputation for the Ferdinand being highly flammable. There is certainly some truth behind it, however referencing this as a widespread issue for the vehicle appears to be a significant exaggeration. 
This is further supported by a report written by Heinz Gruschel, a Porsche advisor attached to a unit fielding Ferdinands who does not list any flaw resulting in many instances of fires. As this was a report meant for the Porsche company, there would be no reason for him to cover this up if it were a widespread problem, especially since it would be vital information to share for future improvements to the vehicles. This is not to say nothing meme-worthy happened to the Ferdinands during their service. One account tells of a Ferdinand being lost during an attack when part of a Panzer III was launched into the air by an explosion, landing on top of the Ferdinand, destroying the gun tube, aiming device, and reportedly setting it on fire. This resulted in a total loss of both vehicles, and certainly would have been a sight to behold. On top of these losses for the Ferdinands themselves, their mobility also proved to be lacking. One report details how their slow speed resulted in high losses for the remote-controlled Borgvard 4s, which often had to wait for them to catch up, leaving them vulnerable. This is contrasted with a similar advance done with Tigers, which proved far more successful. Bear in mind that this is not to say the Ferdinands did nothing, as they proved quite effective, particularly against enemy tanks. The exact number of kills attributed to Ferdinands will never be known for certain, but given the various German combat reports, they proved incredibly deadly. Some even estimate that they may be the most successful tank destroyer of the war in regards to their ratio of losses to enemy vehicles destroyed. The truth of this is difficult to say due to overestimated kill counts and propaganda, but even accounting for those factors, these vehicles proved to be extremely effective tank killers. Following the heavy fighting in July, the Ferdinands were finally pulled back in August for much needed maintenance. By this point, a little over half the Ferdinands remained operational, and fewer still were actually reported as ready for combat, with even those still needing some degree of work. Many required new engines, overhauls to various systems, or other vital repairs if they were to survive further combat use. Unfortunately for the tank destroyers, these repairs were repeatedly interrupted with Ferdinands being called upon to help in various defenses. Although some were able to be quickly repaired and provided much needed relief for the forces holding back the Soviet advance, it only further exacerbated their need for further maintenance. This would continue for several months until virtually no Ferdinands were combat ready and the decision was finally made in December to begin withdrawing them from the east to be completely overhauled back at Nibelungenwerk. Even this did not go smoothly, with many being delayed until January due to constant Soviet pressure. An extremely common misconception, which I also believed prior to researching for this video, is that it was at this point that the Ferdinands became elephants following their refitting. However, this is not the case with the change in name coming several months prior in November. This was done at the request of Hitler and was implemented early the following year. Considering this was also the point when the Ferdinands were being refitted, it is completely understandable why this would cause confusion over the reason for the change. The survivors of the trial by combat in the East returned home to be reunited with some of their fallen brethren, which had been recovered and sent back earlier in 1943. Thanks to the increased repair capabilities of the fully equipped factories compared to the ones closer to the front, these were brought back to life ready to serve once more. Along with the much-needed repairs, the Elephants now were given better visibility courtesy of a commander's cupola and regained the hull machine gun which had been lost during the original conversion into Ferdinand's. Now with new engines, a coating of Zimrit paste, and new engine gratings, these tank destroyers were once again ready to face the enemy. This time, however, they would face both a new environment and a new enemy. By late 1943, Germany had not only lost their initiative in the east, but they had also entirely lost North Africa. Now with their Italian allies surrendering, Germany found itself forced to defend against Allied forces for the first time on European soil when the Italian invasion began in September. When the Americans then successfully landed at Anzio, the situation only grew more dire and the need for increased forces became more clear. Among the available vehicles to counter this invasion were some of the Elephants which were quickly sent to Italy. 
In total, this would amount to 11 elephants, along with one recovery vehicle, as the rest were still awaiting refitting. Two were lost almost immediately after arriving in Rome, not due to enemy fire, but due to an inability to recover them after they sustained damage. Once again, the use of the vehicles as assault tanks proved costly, and the remainder were pulled back and used in a more defensive role. Despite their new improvements, the performance of the tank destroyers in Italy was lackluster to say the least. Enemy air power resulted in several losses, alongside more being abandoned and destroyed after being immobilized. One was even lost when the bridge it was crossing collapsed under its weight, resulting in the death of the commander and total loss of the vehicle. Only two or three would survive their time in Italy, returning to Austria in August of 1944. After their Mediterranean holiday, the Elephant forces would be sent back east for the remainder of the war. This would largely be a repeat of their first deployment, and as with all German vehicles by this point, were constantly in need of repairs and maintenance. Overheating remained a consistent problem, but as before, their effectiveness against enemy tanks cannot be understated. Similar to their time in Italy, however, many were destroyed at the hands of the Germans to prevent them from being captured. Among the ones lost to enemy fire or abandoned was the sole Tiger P to see combat which had been rebuilt as a command tank for the Elephants, as well as several of the recovery vehicles. The effectiveness of these tank destroyers would remain basically unchanged for the remainder of the war with their armor and firepower being able to withstand and knock out just about anything they encountered. As with all of the so-called German wonder weapons though, their numbers continued to dwindle as more and more were lost in combat or to mechanical failure. The final few would remain fighting up till the very end of the war, with two being used in the defense of Berlin, and one defending just south of Berlin in Lupten. If you would like to learn more about the combat use of the Elephant, I highly recommend the combat history of German heavy anti-tank unit 653 in World War II by Karl Heinz Munch. It includes not just original combat reports, but also letters from some of the surviving veterans recalling events. If you're looking for light reading, this isn't the book for you, but if you want an incredibly detailed look at this slice of World War II history, it is well worth getting a copy. I'll link it below for anyone interested. Although a handful of Ferdinands appear to have survived the war, only two remain today with a pre-refit Ferdinand in the Russian Kubinka Tank Museum and another post-refit Ferdinand in the United States. You can actually see footage of the restoration of the American Elephant in the series Tank Overhaul, and it was loaned out as part of a display at Bovington Tank Museum for a short time. It has since returned to the U.S. and is part of the United States Army Ordnance Training and Heritage Center at Fort Greg Adams, formerly Fort Lee, in Virginia. At the time of writing this, that collection is unfortunately not open to the public. Despite the high levels of success seen by their crews, the Ferdinand was in many ways a vehicle cursed by its design. An insufficient cooling system, combined with the immense weight of the machine, crippled its abilities in combat and resulted in many being lost or unavailable for combat. The use of such a vehicle as an assault tank saw mixed results, and though effective in more defensive roles, it must be asked whether a lighter vehicle could have performed that same role. Vehicles such as the Nashorn did exist and featured essentially the same armament. However, the Ferdinand did provide a way to reuse hulls which had already been produced and get them to where they were desperately needed. In this way, the Ferdinand slash Elephant remains a strange example of a vehicle which was both an astounding success and a majorly flawed design. It also marked a shift alongside vehicles like the Tiger towards heavier and heavier designs which would eventually result in the heaviest tank ever built, also designed by Ferdinand Porsche, but that's a story for another day. So what's your opinion on the Ferdinand? Was it a good use of otherwise wasted resources, or was it a design that should never have seen the light of day? Let me know down in the comments. I want to give one last thanks to Ground News for sponsoring today's video, and remind you to use the link below to save 30% on unlimited access. Huge thanks to them for supporting my channel, and to all of you for watching. As always, shout out to my Conly fans who also support my content. 
If you liked this video, I highly recommend you watch the previous episode on the Tiger P if you missed it, as it will show you even more of the story behind the vehicle which led to the Ferdinand. If you've already seen it, consider checking out whatever other video on your screen YouTube thinks you'll enjoy. See you there.